program deals with controversial subjects. The theories, opinions, and beliefs expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. UFOs. Is there a government conspiracy to keep the truth from America? Tonight on the UFO Conspiracy, a team of investigators uncovers provocative new evidence. We're dealing with a cosmic Watergate. From New York, reporter Sandra Pinkney investigates an alleged UFO crash that the government won't talk about. I know that I saw a night turn into daylight. Could this startling footage be proof? It's a very advanced uh, government project, or it's an exotic spacecraft. From Canada, Russell Rhodes hunts for the mystery man behind these revealing images. Could you talk to me about the UFOs? Is Guardian really the deep throat of UFO conspiracies? The area seems to be a hotbed. And from Puerto Rico, Natalie Brunt uncovers reports of mysterious underground activities. People have seen actual UFOs, flying saucer, whatever, going into the lagoon or coming out from the lagoon. Welcome to Encounters. I'm John Marshall. After years of reported UFO encounters, a pattern suggesting government cover-ups has emerged. Tonight, an in-depth investigation into charges that our government maintains an agenda of disinformation and harassment aimed at UFO witnesses and researchers, citizens who believe they have the right to know what the government knows. I've undergone so much harassment so much ridicule, so much torment. I don't want other people to have to go through this. And if they want to do anything with me, let them do it. They took my help. They've ruined my life. So what else could they do? And that the two of them had been told by the military people that if they ever talked about this, not only would they be killed, but their family would be killed. The Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the DIA, you name it, FBI, every intelligence agency or law enforcement group within the government structure has been involved in UFOs one way or another. Anybody who says the United States government is not withholding information about flying saucers is simply either ignorant or intentionally lying or both. Someone very high up is trying to keep a lid on the whole thing. Why would the government keep all this secret since World War II unless there's a damn good reason? These UFO researchers are convinced. The pattern of cover-up started in July 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico. On that date, civilian reports of a UFO crash were actually confirmed by the military in this press release. But strangely, barely 24 hours later, that same military was denying that anything of an extraterrestrial nature had ever happened. That story set the tone for almost 47 years of massive misrepresentation and cover-up. We're dealing with a cosmic Watergate that continues to this day. And one of the many myths about this subject is that the Freedom of Information Act gives you access to anything you want there can't possibly be a cover-up that would extend that law. That any classification reasons for security that existed in 1947, I couldn't see would be valid in 1994. And, and I think if that is the case, it's time to unclassify the matter. We've tried to go to court to retrieve some of this material. A group of us called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy went after the CIA. We want your UFO stuff. They said, we don't have any. Go away. We appealed. They denied. We go to court. Judge says, do a search. They come back to court, they found 239 UFO documents. Did the Freedom of Information Act provide the information windfall researcher Stanton Friedman was looking for? Hardly. You can read eight words 
on this CIA UFO document. And they're not very useful words. Doc reference, info location, stuff like that. Now, these guys have a weird sense of humor. I mean, here's a page, deny in toto, it says. They couldn't even find eight lousy words to release. In fact, after an exhaustive search, the only official document we've found that acknowledges the potential threat of UFOs is this, a firefighter training manual endorsed by FEMA. I think that this is the first time the subject of unidentified flying objects has been included as a serious subject in a larger technical manual. Most of the information in this chapter is borrowed heavily upon some Defense Department documentation that explains what to do in the event of an encounter with an alien being. Since 1947, there have been over 26,000 reported sightings of UFOs in the U.S. alone. The number of sightings that go unreported is estimated to be over 15 million. Police investigator Larry Fawcett became a serious UFO researcher after his own encounter with a UFO was vehemently denied by the government. His reaction? It changed uh, my outlook on life really uh, quite a bit. It was a dramatic change from somebody saying and believing there's no such things to saying wow you know not only are these things real but we're, but we're being lied to about it by the government well I don't trust our United States government and I don't mean to be short or ugly but that's exactly the way I feel and if they want to do anything with me let them do it they took my health they've ruined my life so what else could they do? It happened on a trip through Texas in 1980. Betty Cash, her friend Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's son Colby all experienced something that has never been explained. There was a bright light, a metallic craft, and intense heat. We were literally burning up alive. My head was swollen. I had blisters all over my body from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I was so sick, I, I prayed to die. That's just how sick I was. All three were hospitalized with symptoms of radiation poisoning. The prognosis from Betty's doctor was not good. He called my daughter from Dallas, and he told her that he felt like she should come immediately. So she flew down there, and the doctor, Colby and Vicky, and I don't know who else was in the room at the time, heard the doctor tell my children that he didn't see any way that I was going to make pull through it. I'm sorry. Betty's case of cancer is now in remission. Just what really happened? To this day, the government denies any knowledge or involvement. But Betty believes otherwise. We drove to Bergstrom Air Force Base. They more or less laughed in our faces. Told us that they hadn't even heard anything about it. They knew nothing about it. But yet, when we walked in on this large conference table, there was a huge mouth and they had a red, you know, these little red top pins. They had a little pin sticking in the identical spot. I believe that was the case right there that, that they didn't want anybody to touch. But finally, someone in Washington may be listening. Congressman Stephen Schiff of New Mexico is responding to his constituents. He has launched a congressional effort to get to the bottom of government stonewalling about the Roswell incident. I couldn't begin to tell you why the Department of Defense has acted in this fashion. This is the first time that I can remember one agency simply referring me to another agency and washing their hands of the matter. And then in this particular case, the second agency, the National Archives, says they don't have anything. So uh, uh, this is beginning to look like a runaround, and I, and I hope that's not the case, and I hope there's a, a valid explanation for what's going on. But at the moment, I tell you the truth, I'm baffled about it. There is an, an effort by the government to keep you away from what's happening here, okay? And that, that, that continues on today, and like I said, I object to that. 
we pay the tabs. The, government, the Constitution says we the people. It doesn't say we the CIA, we the NSA. It says we the people. And how they can sit up there and not feel that they're uh, not obligated to us, it's beyond me. What could motivate our government to maintain this alleged cover-up for so long? Russell, what have your contacts told you about a possible rationale for a cover-up? Many people within the UFO community believe that releasing proof of UFOs would so drastically change our concept of society that officials would have to keep what they know secret. Perhaps they would, Russell. Natalie? Imagine the effect it would have on everything from economics to religion to suddenly find out that our global village is actually a galactic village. And another reason for this government secrecy just might be their protectiveness about top secret aircraft testing. And uh, as Sandra has found out, some of those tests could be going wrong. That's right, John. In fact, in the New York incident I've been investigating, the government denies all knowledge of any crash. Their denial runs counter to dozens of eyewitnesses who are convinced of what they saw. Coming up next, reporter Sandra Pinkman investigates an alleged UFO crash that the government won't talk about. I saw a night turn into daylight. Could this startling footage be proof? It's an exotic spacecraft. Counters has been exploring reports of a UFO crash in Long Island, New York, that have the community there deeply divided. Investigating this sighting has been a study in sharp contrasts. On the one hand, no one in an official capacity will confirm anything ever happened. Yet sincere, credible people in that area swear that a UFO crashed in their local park. I know that I saw a night turn into daylight, so whatever it was, it was very large and very strong and nothing I'd ever experienced before. The police officer was describing to his desk sergeant that there was a trail of trees and telephone poles. He said that were all seven, eight to ten feet high. He said and there was a path going into the woods. That's why he thought perhaps something had crashed into the woods. Suffolk County police officer had come into the building asking to use a payphone. And he also seemed upset. He just said that there was some kind of UFO or something that flew over West Babylon and had headed east and crashed in South Haven Park. All of a sudden, the road was blocked off. I've never seen the fire department really block the road that heavily. And especially, it was a strange time at night. And the other part that was curious was that there were no sirens going. It was going on for like three nights in a row. The helicopters and searchlights looking in the park. Something, I don't know what, crashed in, in South Haven that night. Our investigation began when we saw this videotape leaked by a government defense subcontractor who claimed it was shot at the site of the crash. I managed to get some fairly impressive video, what I firmly believe to be a downed extraterrestrial object. One of the first to publicize the alleged crash was South Shore Press editor Rich King. One of the most important facts, especially in a story like this, is to find something on an official level that doesn't make a lot of sense. We've been doing the paper here for 10 years, and we know the patterns within the community. We know when the park opens, when it closes. And we did find out that, indeed, the county had closed the park for four to five days during that period in November. And that is atypical of the county to do that. In developing the information further, what we could ascertain was apparently the Brookhaven laboratory ended up responding to the call rather than a local community service. So suddenly this had the earmarks of something federal as opposed to local. Eyewitnesses say that the entrances to this park were closed shortly after the crash. They say they were stopped by roadblocks and they saw fire engines. But according to park officials and the Long Island Fire Department, it never happened. I had a chance to speak with South Haven Park Superintendent Bud Corwin, who's been living on site in the park for more than 20 years. There's speculation that a crash happened here in this park, mm -hmm. November 24th, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about it? Not a thing. Not a thing. In fact... Of course, uh, very shortly after that, we were asked if we knew anything about it, or like people could come in and look, because as a group, 
that uh, looks for UFOs and objects yeah. like this. And uh, no, in fact, I know this park uh, like the back of my hand. I've been on it all my life. But we have park police. And the park police patrol all the time. And if they had seen or heard anything, I'd know it within two minutes. His story was corroborated by the chief operating officer of Suffolk County's Fire Rescue Department, Miles Quinn. There was no fire alarms, active fire alarms dispatched at that time. Possibly a fire truck might have been out for a driver training lesson or something like that, and they would use a park facility to practice with a new driver. But other than that, I wouldn't have a, an explanation for why there would be fire apparatus in the area. In search of an answer, I spoke with aviation specialist and former member of the Army Special Forces, Chuck DeCaro. You ask yourself, what else is in the neighborhood? Well, Grumman is in the neighborhood, and they build airplanes. The EA-6B, for instance, has electronic warfare systems. You don't want it to fall in the wrong hands. If one of these pods had fallen off, that would explain why the government would uh, try to secure the area and, and get the pod. But a group of local residents aren't buying this explanation. John Ford, president of the Long Island UFO Network, spoke to encounters about the crash that never happened. Our organization has investigated over 600 UFO-related phenomena incidents in the New York metropolitan area with reports coming in as far away as Red China. On the night of November 24th, I myself, who lived three miles from South Haven Park, lost my electric power and cable TV while large military helicopters were overflying the area. I drove down in my pickup truck towards the area of uh, Yapank area and observed a raging forest fire deep in the woods and observed some sort of uh, roadblock. These men were driving military vehicles that had no markings. They were dressed in uh, paramilitary uniforms, black jumpsuits with green fatigue shirts underneath. Five New York State police cars arrived at that location were turned back by these men in black. But if the crash did occur, there would have to be a federal record of the incident. Larry Bryant, public affairs writer for the Defense Department, was brought in to investigate the case. Well, I have recently asked the Federal Bureau of Investigation under a Freedom of Information request to provide all records generated in response to such an incident in Long Island. The reply came back negative. It was here in this remote corner of South Haven Park that the alleged crash happened. Independent field investigations conducted by teams from the Long Island UFO Network resulted in what they claim is definitive proof of the UFO crash. I think we're under surveillance. They're worried we're going to find something today. Boyle, fall in. We're going to be looking for a swatch of trees knocked down, tops of trees knocked off. We're going to be looking for indications of a large fire, radiation, magnetic anomalies. To gather evidence, electrical engineer Preston Nichols joined the investigation. I walked over with the sensor to the tree. Lo and behold, I got a reading. We got a hot spot right here. The tree's uh, radioactive. That would have to be a tremendous magnetic field to do that, to magnetize a tree. So I've never heard of it anywhere else. I was part of that first investigation. We found a fire cone, a yellow fire cape, do not cross letters on it, which was interesting because they told us they were not in the park in the last 10 years. It's heavily discolored. Looks like it was burnt. Look, the top of that tree is sheared right off. Nice clean cut. Highly suspicious. It's possible that if this is the location of the crash, it may have caused uplifting of, of large trees. If you look, there's a certain area here that we found there's three gigantic trees absolutely uprooted, falling in different directions, as if something may have taken them out. But what was most amazing of all was we actually found a radiation suit adjacent to the railroad tracks. This we found very puzzling because we know that people from Brookhaven National Laboratories wear suits similar to this, and we have witnesses that people with white radiation suits were actually in the park that night. But the fire chief of Brookhaven Laboratories Fire Rescue Department denies his team was dispatched. On the night of uh, November 24th, 1992, we did not get called out to any fire off-site. I have copies of my records from that period of time if you'd like to look at them, too.
Firemen who claim that they were dispatched to the crash site on the night of November 24th say they're afraid to go public with what they know. One apparently has been relocated to another state. Another says he fears for his job and his family. Yet, County Fire Dispatcher Miles Quinn vehemently denies that anyone from his department was dispatched on the night in question. J.B. Michaels, researcher and author of an upcoming book on the Long Island crash, spoke with several firemen who were on site on the night of November 24th. Several of the people that I talked to were terrified. They weren't just afraid, they were terrified. Whatever crashed is definitely something the government does not want the public to know about. If it came out that I spoke about this, I would be in a life-threatening situation because it would fall into the realm of national security and at that point they have the option of terminating me. Computer and video expert Jim Delatosa analyzed the video for encounters using a variety of scientific databases. In spectrum analysis you burn a material and you look at its chemical composition. There are also databases principally used by firemen when they arrive at a scene they can videotape flames and fire compare it to a database and know if it's wood or oil or plastic. This is a metal that is burning at high temperature. It didn't fit the normal characteristics of fire that would be in this electro-optical database. I believe it's a very advanced uh, government project that for the safety of the people in the area, the events that happened are masked. Or an exotic spacecraft. We may never know what happened on the night of November 24th, 1992. It's possible that further research could lead to a definitive answer. And as far as citizens of Long Island are concerned, the truth will eventually come out. Congress, uh, executive branch, if you're listening to this uh, message, it's time to stop the cover-up, to tell the people what the government knows and when it knew it about UFO reality. The videotape we received was allegedly provided by a Defense Department subcontractor. It is an important piece of evidence that seems to substantiate eyewitness reports. When we return, more exclusive videotape documenting a UFO incident in Canada. Coming up, reporter Russell Rhodes hunts for Guardian, the mystery man behind these revealing images, and uncovers a town that's a hotbed of UFO activity. It was this huge structure rising up from behind the trees. Videotapes purporting to be documentary evidence of UFOs, but Russell, what distinguishes the tape you have? We received a tape from an informant known only as Guardian. It's an intriguing tape, not only because of its content, but also because of the way in which it came to our attention. This event caught on videotape has no known explanation. On the left, red flames seem to indicate a landing site for an unfamiliar craft. As remarkable as this videotape is, the real mystery of its origin carries even greater intrigue. The tape arrived at the home of former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler. Now an investigations analyst, Bob is considered an expert in the field of UFO identification. Bob receives hundreds of UFO reports, but his interest was piqued when he noticed that this tape had no return address, only the name Guardian and a thumbprint. Guardian also included these strange photographs. According to Exler's research, the figures in the photos match eyewitness descriptions of extraterrestrial beings at other alleged UFO sites. Intrigued with the growing mystery, Bob took a closer look at the videotape. The images were compelling. I clearly got the impression that this uh, was a real event happening in a field somewhere as opposed to some kind of a, an orchestrated hoax of a, of a model. It certainly was not a simple hoax. If it was a hoax involved, this was something of a very extraordinary, elaborate event. The package included documents with official Canadian letterheads. One of the reports described the activities of extraterrestrials here on Earth. Much of the information was blacked out, but the videotape was very detailed. There at least was enough information in the videotape to begin to conduct an investigation uh, as well as conduct a thorough video analysis. Bob sent the video to aeronautic analyst Dr. Bruce McAbee, who subjected the images to exhaustive tests. Uh, this is an unusual video for the amount of detail that it shows. You can see a shape, 
which looks like what you might say a sort of a classic saucer shape. And you can actually see the top beacon, which is flashing, uh, reflected off the surface. So this gives you the impression of a real three-dimensional object out there of uh, some considerable size. I would say it's not a military craft. The military may have been involved in some way in this sighting, but uh, I don't think they were responsible for the craft itself. It would indeed have been possible for the Canadian military or the U.S. military uh, in connection with the Canadians to have tracked this object into the relative area. As I completed my preliminary video analysis, I was convinced that uh, the case merited a full investigation, including uh, a field investigation with an attempt to locate the site. One of the documents that Guardian provided with the video package uh, was a, what appeared to be a scaled drawing of a, a map of an area that essentially confined the area where the landing might have taken place to within about one square mile. Using clues Guardian provided, Bob and his team traveled from Maryland to the site in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Remarkably, the area indicated was marked by a circular patch of destroyed vegetation. Covering the damaged plants was a thin layer of black ash. Samples of the ash went to the lab for analysis. The ash was thought to be residue from what may have been signal flares burning next to the craft. Signal flares can be traced by analyzing their formula. Dr. John Conklin explains about flares and flare compounds. I've prepared a standard red flare composition, which is based on strontium nitrate as the color donating source to the flame. We just burned three or four grams of a composition. The, the flames in the video would have had to have been several pounds of composition and would have left uh, significant amounts, ounces and ounces of residue in the immediate vicinity of where the flame burned. We were under, unable to find even trace amounts of strontium and uh, that again puts another nail in the coffin against this being a military uh, human type operation. At this point, Bob's investigation came to a standstill. Guardian's identity was still a mystery. That's when I arranged to meet him in Ottawa and assist in the investigation. Several months had passed and the outside temperature had dropped to 40 degrees below zero. But Guardian's trail was still warm. As the crew readied our Jet Ranger executive, I wondered who Guardian would turn out to be. He appeared to be working from the inside. Could he be a government informant trying to make the public aware of what the military wants to keep secret? Bob instructed me to meet him in Carp, a small city 30 miles outside of Ottawa. From there, Bob directed the helicopter pilot to the field he believed was the UFO's landing site. Even though it was covered in snow, Bob was able to give me a good idea of the grand scale of this event. What is this Guardian doing to the community here? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, Guardian, uh, trying to remain anonymous here, has uh, managed to do something for the residents who have reported seeing these unusual objects around here because he actually got the videotape. And the videotape allows everyone else to get a look at this, uh, a, what is it, really a structured vehicle. We set up a field research office in the city of Carp. There, Bob brought me up to speed on all the information he had on the search for Guardian. The growing complexity of the investigation prompted me to recruit private investigator Bill Van Kralingen. If Guardian was indeed connected to the government in any way, he might be difficult to find. Bob gave Bill all his information on Guardian, and Bill went to work. We gave Bill the original envelope, postage stamp, and copies of the government forms that were included inside the Guardian package. Last was the fingerprint, but if Guardian didn't have a police record, we'd have to find a match ourselves. Bob and I went to local newspapers looking for eyewitness reports of the UFO landing. There were many documented sightings. UFO sightings are not that unusual, but what makes the Guardian case so interesting is this combination of high-quality video, the physical evidence, and also these remarkable eyewitness accounts. It took no time to gather a group of local townspeople who claimed to have witnessed the UFO event. Most were eager to cooperate. After Bob showed them the Guardian tape, each one shared their version of the experience. I thought I had seen some strobing within the light. At that point, it started coming down and at us. Um, and I became more scared. Suddenly in the sky appears a great 
golden ball with a, a red halo around it. So I thought, I had no idea what it might be. So I got up and went outside to look for something and there was nothing there that I could see, so I ignored it. One witness came forward with a detailed description of her encounter. She requested that we hide her identity because of possible repercussions that her testimony might cause. So why don't we... What happened? Well, um, I saw a, um, a light emanating up from behind the tree line, um, uh, you know, across the way. Uh, it, it was this huge structure rising up from behind the trees. I saw somebody come out of the side upper half of the, the craft. The skin of the person, I'll call it a person for now, um, had a glow to it. And um, uh, as a result, I could see features. This is a photograph taken from the Guardian video. Mm -hmm. Is this the same alien you saw? Well, it certainly, uh, I guess. Sarah appeared to have witnessed the Guardian event, but it was her next observation that gave us our most important lead to the real identity of Guardian himself. So at that point, I ran outside to the end of my driveway. I did hear something coming down the road, um, and I was a little frightened by that. I realized that really it was a car coming down the road without its headlights on. Coming up next, Sarah's lead brings us face to face with Guardian. Well, could you talk to me about the UFOs? Is he the deep throat of UFO conspiracies? The investigation continues. In the search for Guardian. An informant known only as Sarah has provided a critical new lead, a good description of a car she saw on the night of the alleged UFO landing. Based on this new information, we gave the vehicle's description to our private investigator. He began a background check on all similar vehicles that were in the area that day. To eliminate the possibility that Sarah was a part of a hoax, we asked her to submit to a lie detector test. Did you lie about seeing two aliens get out of a craft in front of your house in August 1991? No. The test is now complete. Remain still. Based on what you've seen here, yes. what's your conclusion? My conclusion is Sarah's truthful. What she saw, or what she believes to have witnessed, took place, and she believes this in her own mind. Therefore, she was truthful on this, these charts. She was not fabricating the incident. Then the phone call came from Bill. He had a possible match on the vehicle after tailing the driver to a neighborhood church. He instructed us to meet him on a side street nearby, so as not to draw attention. Okay, which is the best way to uh, come in uh, on the church then? Come in the past the church on the school side and you'll come straight on to us. Then for Having located a potential target, we began our surveillance. See the vehicle down at the back, just before that gray uh, window van on your left? Then for In our primary inspection, we noticed fingerprints on the handle of the door. This could be the link to the true identity of Guardian. If these prints matched his mysterious thumbprint, we would have found the car belonging to Guardian. The Guardian suspect immediately jumped into his car and fled. Although we tried, we could not keep up with him. Could this be Guardian? The answer undoubtedly lies in his unique calling card. Unfortunately, we were unable to get prints off of the photograph and the sub-zero temperature prevented us from using fingerprint tape. But we had a license plate, and that was traced to a private residence. Our stakeout began. Again, we waited, wondering what secrets Guardian was keeping. What could he know that keeps him in hiding? Our entire mission lay on the doorstep of this quiet house. Unexpectedly, the Guardian suspect pulled up in a different car. 
our PI went to work. Hi. Oh, uh, yes. Pleased to meet you. My, uh, my name is Bill Van Crawlingen. Could you yep. talk to me about... Just a moment, please. Could you talk to please. me about yeah. the UFOs? Just, just, just a moment, please, if you don't mind. I'll what? put this away and I'll be right back. Could you uh, talk to me about Guardian? Could you talk to me? The man we believe to be Guardian refused to speak to him. Almost in a panic, he raced off on foot. Bill attempted to follow. Shortly after that video was taken, Guardian broke through our surveillance net. He escaped at a high speed. We just weren't able to keep up with him. Why is Guardian so afraid to reveal his identity? As long as he remains anonymous, we can't know what secrets he is keeping about UFO activity in his community of Carp, Ontario. The area seems to be a hotbed. No one seems to know why. But there have been sightings, you know, constantly for the last few years, and it seems to be escalating. Many people who claim to have knowledge of UFO cover-ups refuse to reveal their identity. It makes confirming their information much more difficult. And until more people are willing to step forward publicly, their credibility will continue to be in question. Coming up next, reporter Natalie Brunt in Puerto Rico uncovers startling evidence about the U.S. military's mysterious underground bases. People have seen actual UFOs, flying saucers or whatever, going into the lagoon or coming out from the lagoon. Investigations encounters has found that UFO sightings are often accompanied by reports of unusual military activity. Ufologists believe that when there is a crash, the government immediately takes all evidence to underground bases so they can reverse engineer the technology for use in military systems. People have seen actual UFOs, flying saucers or whatever, going into the lagoon or coming out from the lagoon. He told us that he had been inside these underground facilities at Groom Lake, that he had seen flying saucers being tested in these underground facilities. We have things out here that are literally out of this world. Kirkland Air Force Base, New Mexico. Cabo Rojo, Puerto Rico. Area 51, Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. All of these diverse locations are rumored to house alien technologies and secret underground facilities. Many experts speculate that these secret bases are used to house captured alien spacecraft and that extraterrestrial beings have been taken there. What really goes on at these underground facilities is totally shrouded in secrecy. In national security jargon, the activities are known as black programs. Black programs or black projects are projects which the Department of Defense considers so sensitive and so secret that they don't even reveal their existence. As far as the public is concerned, they don't exist. Unbeknownst to the general public, in order to conceal these covert activities, huge underground installations have been dug deep into the earth to keep prying eyes at bay. Because of their black program status, some researchers believe these underground bases house research and development facilities for recovered alien craft. In southern Nevada, one such underground base is alleged to exist. Known as Area 51, this top-secret installation fostered such classified programs as the U-2, SR-71, and the Aurora. Area 51 is the most classified government installation in the free world. It is the premier testing facility for every black program that the United States government and some of its allies want to, want to test. But spy planes and stealth bombers are only the beginning. Bob Lazar, a former government scientist, came forward and said, I worked on these things. We're reverse engineering alien technology. We're taking apart flying saucers to figure out how they work. The same alien spacecraft may be what residents in southern Nevada have been viewing for the past 30 years. What I saw was four to five pewter, silver, circular ships flying at tremendous speed, outrageous flight characteristics. Uh, four different people who have worked at Area 51 who have told me they have seen disc-shaped craft being tested out there. 
Now these are people from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. People who don't know each other, all essentially telling the same story. The existence of these programs could explain the post-Cold War tightening of security around Area 51. The perimeter is continually patrolled by a paramilitary unit wielding deadly force. There are motion detectors in the ground to, to determine when people are trying to come in. There are ammonia detectors that can detect the ammonia scent in human skin. There are planes, there are helicopters, uh, there are guided missiles. They could shoot you right now, drag your body in there, and there isn't a, there isn't a law enforcement agency in this country that can go and retrieve your body. Our research also indicates that the government has expanded activities to bases outside the continental U.S. On the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico, a myriad of UFO activity has flourished since 1987. Most of it has been centered here at the Laguna Cartagena outside Cabo Rojo. Although there have been thousands of witness sightings, the local authorities and the U.S. government continue to ignore the reports, fueling the belief of many residents here that a cover-up, perhaps even a conspiracy, exists. Jorge Martin, a leading editor and investigator, has been researching the UFO phenomenon in Puerto Rico for 20 years. What he has uncovered near this picturesque lagoon has led him to some startling conclusions. Are you suggesting that there is some kind of underground base beneath the lagoon or this area? There's something very important going on here. Something is down there, maybe some type of alien facility that has been there for many years. People have seen actual UFOs, flying saucer, whatever, going into the lagoon or coming out from the lagoon. We saw the wall of the lagoon illuminate and in the dark, something emerging from the water. Mr. Carday, you were out fishing one morning. Can you tell me what you saw? It's the 5.45 in the morning. I see in the water uh, the bubbles. A minute later, I see the, the flying up that go out the water and it stay 20 seconds in the air. After this, I take my camera and take the picture. In analyzing Mr. Carday's photograph, there's no evidence of a hoax. It doesn't appear as though it was a mistake in the film lab, but there's nothing that has edges on it that we can test with the computer. All we could test for was whether or not it was misty or moving. And it seems to be one of those. Another eyewitness, Amore Rivera, adds to this incredible story, his own tale of abduction and detention in an underground facility. So you believe this was an underground base underneath the sea that you were taken to? Yes. It looked like an underground parking lot, sort of. It didn't have no windows, it didn't have no doors. From there, um, I lost consciousness and I woke up in this car and I was um, in an area right near um, the Laguna Cartagena. And at this moment is where I, I hear the, the jets flying overhead and they're making a lot of noise. And I look up to see the jets. So what I saw was a, a round, huge round disc object. And I snapped um, these photographs. We found in this photograph, looking at the edges, looking at light reflectivity, the angles, the proportions indicate that this is a flying jet in pursuit of or flying around a disc-shaped object. I think that what the witness reported is what happened. Coincidentally, at the time of these sightings, the government began seizing large quantities of surrounding public land, effectively ending further private investigation. There are indications that this seizure agenda is going on near the sites of other underground bases. What is the government's motive? What if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space? Act was created to give all Americans access to government documents. Unfortunately, that has not been the case with UFO records. Even government officials like Congressman Schiff are getting the runaround. But his efforts have been an important step toward the release of long-held UFO files. If our government has identified the U in UFO, we have a right to know. Until our next encounter with the unknown, I'm John Marshall. Good night.